However, you, I, I'm flexible either way. And I mean, should I just? You can say, "Well, who are you? <laughs> Would you mind introducing?" Well, who the hell are you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what are you doing here? How do you know? You didn't ask for any ID. I could be my brother. This is the dog catcher. He's actually older. <laughs> um, well, if I don't know, it might feel more natural if I introduce you. And if I do, how would you like me to? Um, I'm the former director of the National Rabies Program at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Currently, I'm an independent global consultant on, for public health, affiliate professor at Auburn University, and expert technical advisor for the World Health Organization for rabies. Okay. Or, um, you, or you could just say, would you mind introducing yourself That's to what audience? I'll do. That's because what I'll that do. way you don't have to worry about right, slippage right. or tongue twisters. Or and very basic question I should know. Are you... Um, more research, or were you practicing veterinarian? Or? Uh, I never went into practice. I went into veterinary medicine because of the population health issues and wildlife. Okay. Penn at the time took about 10% of what they regarded as weirdos because they viewed that the veterinary profession, we didn't, I mean, we were always doing One Health, we just didn't have that moniker. And so they figured they needed a little bit of diversity in there. So there, there were a few of us kooks that were more interested in wildlife than as opposed to dog and cat medicine. And so the One Health actually refers to? <clears throat> One Health is a concept that it's not just human health and it's not just veterinary medicine. It's, not, it's also not just wildlife. It's a transdisciplinary concept that actually looks at the traditional, such as animal, environmental, human health, but also goes into some of those other disciplines like social workers, philosophy, economics, archaeology, anthropologists. So if you think that most health issues from a planetary standpoint are multi-causal, it really entails more than a single cadre or a single discipline today. And so the, what we were always, when I say we, I mean the profession, one Health was out of the work of like Virchow, who said that there's not human pathology or animal pathology, there's just one pathology. Pathology is pathology, regardless of species. And so it's always been there more of a universal, transdisciplinary for many years and for many disciplines. And it was only, it's almost overused now. I mean, now it's, it's decades old to the point that people are looking for more terminology because One Health is no longer nuanced. If you say One Health, most veterinarians will understand what you're talking about, and even to wildlife biologists. When you speak about One Health to physicians, they think that veterinarians are going to be delivering babies. They really don't, they really don't understand the concept. And so it's, from a public health standpoint, from a global health standpoint, the biggest challenge is actually getting our physician colleagues on board to understand what that means, because if you consider it, and even traditionally in the past, some veterinarians, it was single practitioner, single patient. Veterinary medicine, it's more of a herd idea. And also similarly for physicians in public health, traditionally, they understand above and beyond the single patient, physician, or practitioner concept. One Health is more of a global planetary one, ecological. And so for people such as myself who grew up in biology, zoology, ecology, and not in the traditional veterinary medicine, it was actually easier to have in that larger arena to go into and specialize as opposed to if you thought of all things bright and beautiful uh, from only a domestic animal standpoint or an individual, it would have been probably harder to then go this way. So it's just a different way of thinking about the world and how to accomplish things. We can, if you want to stop, we can, but I tend to just roll the whole, the whole... Yeah, it's okay, the so utility not, of right, editing. So, yeah, but, this but way the you editors can, can just come back and put that in in context. It's We're, actually, with two camera angles, it's more complicated to stop and keep going. Okay, I'm sorry. No, you're okay. good. Okay. All right. Um, See, that way, if, if one wants to, for example, say, well, what do you mean about 
rabies in a One Health context. Because we assume. It's to the point that, you know, we assume today that everybody knows that bats are reservoirs of rabies, and yet then why do we still continually have people exposed to bats and not getting prophylaxis? It's one of those things where when we assume, it obviously, you know, makes asses out of both, both your audience and yourself. And the issue of One Health is such that we... It's been bandied about so much. We just assume everybody knows what One Health is right, right. today because, you know, it's the buzzword, but, you know, it's not. Well, you said it included social workers. I'm a social worker oh, with yeah. background, and I had no idea. No, for, I mean, if you think of your involvement in this project and even your interest and engagement enough and your spouses to, to have this amount of time... Well, then it also shows that we can't do this by ourselves. I mean, if it was just up to a veterinarian, well, then fine, i got to run around and look for an office, or even, okay, let's do it at my house, but then i got my grandson running around. So, I mean, there, there's an issue above and beyond, even if you weren't involved socially per se from a formal academic standpoint for this arena, people who are involved and engaged in those kinds of sciences, the arts and sciences, also have a role to play in this larger picture. It's oftentimes, too, practitioners are a bit, uh, they, they can get abstract, they can get academic. So next week after Thanksgiving, I'm going to Connecticut for a global health program for physicians and medical students to try to get them engaged and interested to go into public health. You know, why go into public health and why go into global health? And what does that entail? And you, you know enough from your own background. There are some people who are suited to go into sociology or not, or philosophy or not, or public health or not. I mean, they're just, there's some genetic, th you know, some people are more hardwired, and we have some, we have proof of dysfunctional people who can rise to high levels um, into the present day. Um, and some people are just not well suited to do certain things. Absolutely. So uh, I, clearly there's a role for, I, I'm also editing a multi-volume, multi-author book on the history of rabies in the Americas. And some of the most intriguing chapters are not written by veterinarians or physicians, but one of the best ones is by an anthropologist entitled Tell Me Why My Child Died, who went into Venezuela and the government denied that there was an outbreak going on and yet in some of the indigenous communities uh, clearly it was rabies and so then you have to deal with that entire geopolitical, social, anthropological uh, aside from having nothing to do with vaccinating dogs because this was driven by vampire bats oh. and really nothing to intervene with in terms of physicians because they're so remote you don't have the surveillance and the diagnosis so how do you intervene? So. There's a role, obviously. If we, these are very, very complicated, complex issues. This is why there's a role for such people. And that also actually have application to the situation in Ukraine. Uh, of, in a war. of course. Yeah. Of, yeah. of course. It's yeah. not only an animal one. It's not just a public health one. There's a larger geopolitical issue. Yeah. And that that's also one of the good, I would say, questions. You know, why... Why focus on Ukraine? Well, there are... Because then we always get hit with bias and we're hearing things, for example, from some of our African colleagues about the amount of aid there as opposed to why isn't there more aid and why are we being forgotten and is this a pan-colonial, racist... It, there is a reason why. Because Ukraine's a bridgehead. Ukraine is a bridgehead to things that were already moving towards mass prevention and control that has now been upended as opposed to there are a lot of potential bridgeheads in the world but <laughs> rabies is neglected and there's only so much money to go around and so you, it's no different than going into an ER and you're deciding which patient to go ahead based on triage. Geopolitically it's the same thing. You can't it's similar to the question always gets it, can we save all species? Well, in some people's minds, but realistically, no, because we don't even know what species are going extinct now. So by definition, you can't save all.
and because there's only a finite amount of resources that could be spent with a given focus, it's usually the charismatic megafauna, lions and tigers and bears, gorillas, etc., as opposed to those probably are not the most critical drivers in the ecosystem, but it's going to be tough to get support to save some invertebrate or pollinator or even some bats that potentially are more critical than what we see in zoos. There's, this is where we get into the psychology of how we do some mm -hmm. of these things. Mm -hmm. How you make the choices. Yes. So, um, so this is Louis Valente with Ukraine War Animal Relief Fund, and I'm here with Dr. Charles Ruprecht. And Dr. Ruprecht, I'm going to ask you if you would uh, just to introduce yourself and give sure. you a background. Thanks, Louis. I'm Charles Ruprecht. I'm the former National Program Director for Rabies at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Currently, I'm an independent global biomedical consultant. I'm also an affiliated professor at Auburn University, and I'm an expert technical advisor for the World Health Organization on rabies. Excellent. Thank you. So, And I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, very pleased to have you. Um, so we were just, you were giving us an excellent explanation of the concept of One Health, which I think really is a great context for uh, some of the issues that we'd like for you to, um, to speak to in regards to the current rabies situation in Ukraine. Um, and I guess the first question has to do with uh, case fatality rates of rabies. That's a very good question about why should we be interested in rabies and why is it a concern in a One Health topic? And it's because when we talk about a case, a case in infectious diseases, for example, we're talking about some definable quantity, such as a person, an animal, etc. And Fatality, of course, is of the number of cases of that entity, of that disease, what proportion die or succumb. Oftentimes we're thinking of very virulent diseases like Ebola, for example, or we just got finished a pandemic with COVID-19. The highest case fatality rates are in rabies. Rabies has the highest case fatality of any infectious disease, even o much over, you know, that 30-some percent for COVID-19 or even the 70 to 80-some percent or higher with some of the hemorrhagic diseases like Marburg and Ebola. So a lot of people may not understand that one of the reasons why rabies is partly neglected is because it has such a high case fatality. What that means is that trying to intervene for a rabies case is usually fraught with failure. And also because of the virulence of the disease, the R word, most people are very afraid of it. They've been afraid of it for centuries. And so it gets neglected not only because of the high failure rate, almost everyone who develops rabies is going to die. That's what we mean by a case of rabies. But it's also very frustrating to try and intervene in human therapies, let alone trying to save an animal that's clinically rabid, because it's probably close to 100% going to end in failure. Thank you. So, wanted you to, uh, I think you've just addressed a little bit of this, but uh, speak about rabies as a disease. Sure. Rabies is con really considered a disease of nature, and so whether you look outside and you're looking at the eaves of a building, there could be bats under those eaves. There could be raccoons up in those trees and dens. And the base of those trees, there could be ground dens for foxes. On the way here, I must have passed four roadkill animals. Mm -hmm. So in, let's say, 100 miles, you're going to find a half a dozen roadkill animals. If you had the ability to test all of those, some of those would be rabid. So when we talk about rabies as a disease of nature, rabies was here before Homo sapiens and likely will be here after Homo sapiens as well. We can do things to try to control it 
we can do things certainly to exacerbate it, but by and large, even without human involvement, rabies is going to perpetuate. It's going to perpetuate because a lot of people in the past have coined rabies as a bad parasite. Au contraire, that was from the host's standpoint. The niche, if you will, of these viruses that cause rabies is the mammalian central nervous system. And so by and large, if you consider our CNS, the scale of natura, whether in humans or other animals, this is a very intriguing way for viruses to self-perpetuate themselves. Because not only do they use a la cujo, uh, the maniacal animal means of bite transmission, but if you think of mammals as a whole, socially, mammals love to lick, they love to bite. Think about the maternal young bond. Think about the way the dam carries the young animal. Think about all the mucosal exposures. Think of conception itself. Oftentimes it may be female selection, but the male will often bite about the head and neck to maintain the female in a posture for copulation. So the essence of doing what comes naturally in being a mammal, these viruses are being excreted before the animal becomes physically or clinically ill. To me, that's a, a very nuanced way to excrete because you're exploiting normal behaviors. And if for some reason you fail in that, think of less social and more solitary mammals, that aggression or that fawning behavior, the animal that's normally aggressive or normally timid, it's going to alter your behavior. The only characteristic thing about rabies is that it's uncharacteristic in its onset, and it's because its raw material is what we call mammals. All mammals we know of are susceptible. In particular, reservoirs are in the chiroptera, the bats, and the carnivores. These are the two large groups of mammals that form reservoirs, species that are socially, ecologically, genetically almost programmed evolutionarily to be reservoirs that maintain this disease with very specific viruses that are adapted to those particular species that we can differentiate to great detail in the laboratory. When I was a child we only had one species of virus that caused rabies, rabies virus. Today, there's at least 18 different types of lysoviruses. All lysoviruses cause rabies. Lysoviruses, the genus, virologically, taxonomically, that cause rabies. Some of these, we don't even know what the reservoir is. Some of them are genetically so different from traditional rabies virus that we have no vaccines, immune globulins, or human vet veterinary medicine to prevent them. So although we can prevent and control rabies virus and even selectively eliminate rabies virus in some mammalian populations, rabies is not a candidate for eradication because we don't know some of the reservoirs, we don't have biologics for some of the species, and because evolution is real. And new species of lysoviruses are evolving as we speak. Luckily, the most important lysovirus is rabies virus, and since the time of Pasteur, we've had ways to vaccinate animals and people against that particular cause of the disease and shortly thereafter we've been able by laboratory means to diagnose rabies as well not just based on clinical signs so rabies is a very intriguing and successful disease of nature for some of these reasons you had mentioned which I found interesting um, speaking of the roadkill are rabid carcass, if that's the are they able to, um, what? are they infectious? Almost all rabies cases are transmitted by rabies viruses through the bite. However, we can also have mucosal exposure, say licks to the face, mucous membranes, eyes, nose, mouth, etc. We can also potentially have rabies acquired mucosally by consumption of carcasses. So if you have a road-killed dog, raccoon, skunk, fox, etc. 
based upon some environmental variables. If it was a fresh kill and some animal consumed it within a few hours, there's also the possibility because of mucosal exposure, say from brain, the calvarium being open from being hit by a car, and also because of that sharp tissue in the being exposed in the skull for cuts, it, it's also a way to auto-contaminate through consumption. However, in many subtropical, tropical areas, these viruses are very ephemeral, and so they don't exist environmentally. As we speak, and for millennia, rabies is being transmitted in vivo, animal to animal to animal. It's not coming out in feces, it's not coming out in urine, it's not environmentally secure. And so if you think about very hot temperatures, direct radiation from the sun, etc., now, these are going to be inactivated fairly readily within minutes, depending upon the degree of severity, to hours, to if you go up from the tropics to the Arctic, think about Arctic foxes, for example. Um, you have carcasses there. They're going to last potentially, at least before the climate started warming, um, over years. And so, in essence, animals could, through scavenging, road-killed or other killed prey who were rabid. Although interestingly, when you tend to deliver some pathogens via a less than routine route, so if we think of transdermal from a bite, for example, as the routine route that rabies is transmitted and will lead to clinical disease, this is how the concept of oral vaccination was recognized, because it was recognized that if you allow animals to eat the brains of rabid animals, yes, some of them will develop rabies but that some of them will develop virus neutralizing antibodies. And this was one of the data points that gave rise to the concept of oral vaccination that also allows us to go beyond the parenteral single animal inoculation as a way to prevent and control the disease. Well, this uh, stood out to me when, when I visited Ukraine um, fairly early in the war, seeing the number of dead animals around, and, uh, and the difficulty of the population under the circumstances to be able to effectively dispose of the carcass. Um, so I just, I was curious as to whether that in itself presents a threat. Sure. I, I, I think carcasses of rabid animals do pose a threat, potentially and probably more so for other animals who are going to be scavenging and scavenging upon the brain of rabid animals potentially can lead to other cases. There would also be the concern, obviously, for, for humans that might then be scavenging. As long as you can cook the tissue, um, then it's no longer considered infectious. And so as long as we're not talking about brain tartare, um, it won't be an issue. However, if things under less than ideal conditions are not cooked adequately, uh, and there's large amounts of nervous tissue involved that might be consumed. When we look at so-called cases of rabies in people that have been associated with, with food, it's usually in the preparation. And so there are some cultures of the world, and we certainly know historically that people have resorted to eating uh, dogs. It's a cultural phenomenon as well as a necessity under certain circumstances that if that's not cooked appropriately, it poses a risk. But more importantly, it's in the preparation. Mm -hmm. And so in the killing of the animal, in the harvesting of tissues, particularly in and around the head, there's the possibility for contamination of other tissues. There's the possibility of contamination if you have lesions on your hands. So most of the so-called associated cases in humans of rabies from eating really is in the preparation and in the butchering of the animals under less than ideal circumstances. Thank you. So currently in Ukraine, um, because the war uh, continues, um, the population, the human population, is not able to hunt. They can't go into the woods, obviously because there are enemy soldiers, there are mines, there's unexploded ordnance. Um, so the question would be, 
what will happen if the current cat and dog population continues to grow while rabies spread faster because of these circumstances with the wolf and fox population particularly um, who have, I guess, somewhat of a high incidence of, of rabies in, in the natural environment. If you think about the situation before the war when people had their dogs and cats vaccinated and under veterinary care and when for either what we would call bushmeat recreational hunting um, was going on in Europe the red fox is one of the major reservoirs that has perpetuated rabies. In fact, there was a very, very large outbreak that started post-World War II. So it was another war that actually precipitated the relevance of rabies in wildlife, particularly in foxes, into Western Europe over the past several decades. And it was only because of oral vaccination that Western Europe was able to control and actually eliminate rabies in red foxes where the combination of normal mortality factors as well as hunting pressure now combined with intervention directly by oral vaccination was able to prevent, control, and actually eliminate rabies in red foxes from the west and sort of pushing that front all the way to the east. Which means up until the time that the Ukraine war broke out, the European Union was looking at Eastern Europe as the last front to try to make or move towards the EU being rabies free. With the onset of the war, the breakdown of veterinary health, the breakdown of prophylaxis and public health without any interventions to try and manage wildlife populations, what that means is a lot of that work from the prior decades is going to be reversed because you'll have then the rise in some of the wildlife reservoir populations who aren't going to be vaccinated or hunted. You're going to have spillover then from wildlife into domestic animals and domestic animals that are free-ranging and unvaccinated. And so both the wildlife rabies situation is going to be exacerbated. The cross-species transmission of wildlife to dogs and cats is going to occur and has occurred, as we know. When you look at the WHO rabies bulletin of Europe, we're seeing those cases, which surveillance is out the window as well from the public health standpoint. We only know from the periphery that that's growing. And you're also having then the trans-country spillover of cases that was formerly under control because of traditional and oral vaccination measures, vaccinations of dogs and cats, populations of wild animals that were vaccinated, and prophylaxis in humans that may have got exposed. This has the threat of undoing all of those decades worth of work and obviously imposing a great public health burden affecting people, wildlife, and domestic animals in what we would consider a one health catastrophe now. Well, speaking of people, what is it like when someone contracts rabies, a human? When you see your first case of human rabies, you really can't forget it because one, particularly they tend to be young, so it's going to be a child. And two, the individual wax and wanes, they actually start to understand what they're going through. It starts very non-specifically, fever, aches and pains, it's almost flu-like, very nonspecific. And shortly thereafter, one of the paradigms of rabies in humans, what we call hydrophobia, you get the paralysis of the throat muscles, so you not only get dehydrated from fever and this acute progressive encephalitis, but the sight or sound of water or even the wafting of air, or air coming from a fan or air conditioning, will provoke these spasms, these uncontrollable spasms. And so when you look at some of the archival footage of individuals who know that they're thirsty or know that they're hungry and just trying to drink will provoke these spasms and the water will be thrown, 
Um, they'll start to regurgitate. They'll start to, to throw up. They'll salivate to great amounts. That old idea of seeing the froth, that's because of the large amounts of saliva that are being produced, infectious, as well as the inability to swallow, which if you think if you beat an egg, leads to froth. That's one of the reasons in an animal or a human, traditionally you may have seen that suggestion of froth. Incubation period in rabies, the time between when a person is exposed and when they show some of these horrific clinical signs, on average it's about four to six weeks. These are nerve-loving viruses and so it partly depends on the part of the body, the severity, the dose, of that bite or that infection. And so a longer period, say if you were bitten on the foot, much shorter if you were bitten on the head. Worst case situations, think about a small child and a large dog. Situations like this, child could be dead in a week if you have intracranial inoculation of those virions directly into the brain. If you have a little bit of virus in a less severe area, for reasons that we don't don't understand, a certain proportion of patients have incubation periods more than six months, more than a year. The longest documented incubation period that we have on record is eight years, which is always a bit challenging when you're talking to an exposed person. And I've never really fully understood when they want to know, well, what do I have to look for? Well, if they start to find these traditional signs in themselves, you hope your bucket list is finished. You hope that your will is filled out. So I've never really understood psychologically that fatalistic, well, what do I have to look for? Because what you're going to find if you show those signs is you're going to be dead in a relatively short period of time from the nonspecific into the traditional and very quickly into coma and death. 14-day period from onset of death on average, and even with prolongation by uh, intensive care units today, uh, all that's going to do is prolong the inevitable. So to suggest to a patient that, yeah, you could potentially have an incubation period of several years, that doesn't owe to anyone's self-confidence who's been exposed to a rabid animal. What you're describing kind of speaks to what I've always heard is that it's a pretty horrific death. It's whether you're talking about a puppy or a child, um, they're, they're fairly horrific. And uh, the end stage of life in particular, when that patient is gasping for air, um, really stays with one. And because of the fear, I mean, many diseases, we've feared smallpox, for example, and plague throughout the ages, um, influenza. Rabies has also been a pariah, and if you look at, unfortunately, in some lower and middle income countries, the way that we manage our rabies patients, they're, they're basically a cell. They're a padded bedroom, the patient is in restraints, and for the most part, we'll ask for help and we'll ask for water, at the same time we'll have spasms of hydrophobia, aerophobia, and as you can imagine, most medical staff are not vaccinated and so will psychologically probably be less able and probably more reluctant to go ahead and provide the basic medical care, palliative care, um, supportive care. This is sedation. This is one of the reasons why most people in the world die at home as opposed to having your loved ones die in a padded cell. So I think you just spoke to this, but once contracted by a human, is it curable? Unfortunately, with such a high case fatality, rabies is not curable. We have no licensed antivirals. We have no proven therapeutic. There have been a few what we would call survivors from the 70s. Usually these were vaccine failures, people who were exposed, were vaccinated, and for whatever reason may not have gotten the ideal prophylaxis, developed clinical signs of rabies, and under heroic care survived. And in 2005, 
Gina Gysi became the first person who was exposed to rabies, developed clinical signs of rabies, and again through Herculean efforts uh, was able to survive rabies without a history of any vaccination. So we've known prior in the 20th century and now in the 21st century of a few of these cases, but if you consider the burden of rabies in the world, and nobody really knows how many human cases there are, you'll hear <laughs> and for so many years, 59,000 people die. I'm sorry, there's no disease that always has X number, X every year for those number of years. We know that we can have, in a good year, tens of thousands of people die. In a bad year, it might be up to 100,000. That's out of tens of millions of people exposed, majority of whom hopefully will be prophylaxed to some extent. And in exposure, there, there are variables that go on, say, after a dog bite. Is that an animal excreting rabies in its saliva? Nobody's looking at the saliva we diagnose from the brain. How much is coming out in the saliva? We're not monitoring that. And so, is it a bite through clothing? There's so many variables. Is what part of the body? Um, this is one of the reasons if you have a mass exposure, say a single rabid dog exposed multiple people, some people will succumb and some won't. Uh, some of it has to do with the relative severity and the amount of virus that's inoculated into those individuals. And so it's a very uncompromising situation. That's why we don't take any risks when someone's been exposed. They've been exposed and it's either a known or likely or laboratory diagnosed animal. They get prophylaxed. When you have the breakdown of infrastructure, when you have animals who aren't vaccinated, when you have rise of wild populations and the dissemination of rabies through those populations, cross-species transmission to unvaccinated animals, and then because the human-animal bond with domesticated, you're also then going to have more individuals without a lack of, with a lack of laboratory-based surveillance to find out if the animal that bit them was diagnosed. And so the prophylaxis rate will go up because you simply don't have the luxury of having the animal in hand and be able to determine in a short period of time sensitively and specifically, yes, the animal is rabid or not, you're going to prophylax because of the, the history and the clinical signs when you don't have that luxury of laboratory expertise. Got it. Thank you. Based on the data you've seen, is, is rabies epidemic in Ukraine, in Eastern Europe at this point? I, I think from the numbers that we're seeing and hearing about and the conditions that are obvious in Ukraine that rabies is, is, if it's not there yet, then it's probably pushing towards being epizootic. And epizootic is such that it's above and beyond the norm. And so one could define it as 20% or so above what the norm is. Well, if the norm was before relatively few rabid animals and certainly relatively few exposed people because Wild animal populations were more or less managed. Domestic animals were being vaccinated. Anybody who was being exposed was having the ability of laboratory-based surveillance and ability of biologics, vaccines, and immune globulins to get prophylaxis. Now that's all out the window. We have no management going on of wildlife. We know that Eastern Europe in that particular front in the Russian Federation is a huge focus of rabies. We don't have the degree of prevention and control in Eastern Europe and the Russian Federation as we do in Western Europe. So all of this is ex exacerbated. No management in wildlife, no routine vaccination of dogs and cats, no routine laboratory-based surveillance, and then the inability probably of having life-saving biologics administered to those people who really need it. All of those are the makings of an epizootic, but without having the ability of surveillance, what's the sound of a tree in a poorly visited forest? Does it make a noise? It certainly has all the makings of it. And from the bits of data that are coming out of Eastern Europe, I don't think you'd find many people who would disagree that there's an ongoing epizootic in that particular theater. Thank you. You know, I think a large part of both the population here in the U.S. and probably in the world first became 
even cognizant of the concept of epidemic with COVID. I think epidemic was pretty new to most of us prior to COVID. Can you make a comparison between the COVID epidemic and, and what's going on with rabies? You could probably make a comparison between what occurred in COVID to a limited degree in what's going on in Ukraine in the sense that most probably people weren't aware of what a pandemic was, meaning something that involved the entire world as opposed to an epidemic. And of course, pandemic being much greater in magnitude, regardless, I think the pandemic brought to the forefront public health, what this meant in terms of global health, and how individual health was affected by people sometimes very far away. COVID epidemic, pandemic, of course, being spread through the respiratory route. And this is one of the reasons why we're most concerned epidemiologically and in public health in terms of, say, respiratory pathogens, flu, RSV, measles, etc. Most of the diseases that were of cons greatest concern globally because of the impact on humans in particular have a high biotic potential and are sub not. And so what that means is that, for example, on average, if you had measles and you were able to sneeze and cough in a room and then left, on average, about 10 people are going to get infected for every one. And that measles or other respiratory viruses, potentially, depending on the virus or the pathogen, may actually linger. Luckily for us, although it's similar in terms of pathogen host environment, and all of those will determine the dynamics, the reason that rabies, luckily, when it can be prevented and controlled is because our R sub naught is one, which means on average, a single rabid individual will lead to another case. That's one of the reasons why historically over the last century we've been able to make the inroads that we have in domestic animals towards the elimination of canine rabies in all developed countries and increasingly even in wildlife such as in North America and in Europe and in Korea and in parts of the Middle East through the use of oral vaccinations that can be distributed for wildlife. So there are some similarities although it it pales because of the magnitude, even with a disease that may have had a lower case fatality, but because of its magnitude and because of its focus in certain human populations and propagation in humans, that luckily we're looking at domestic or wild animal reservoirs as opposed to luckily, in, except in very, very rare situations, we don't have human to human transmission. If you were to get hit by a car and you were incubating rabies and your organs were transplanted, which has occurred, then obviously the individuals who receive your organs, so there are some very bizarre cases of human-to-human -human transmission, but it's not at all anything like, say, respiratory pathogens or the, the COVID-19, beyond the concept of what's involved. Got it. So I think you've already spoken to this, um, but in your opinion, uh, rabies um, situation in Ukraine is not going to be limited to Ukraine, but there is potential, if not high potential, that it's going to spread throughout Eastern Europe. Well, obviously, the current situation in Ukraine is and of itself a concern to U Ukrainians, but obviously it's also going to impact that border. And this is one of the reasons why we are concerned about Ukraine in particular, and rabies in this situation, as well as a number of other diseases, is because Ukraine is a bridgehead. Because we were making, pro when I say we, I mean the, the global community was making such progress in rabies and domestic animals and in wildlife in Western Europe, increasingly to the east. All of that is now placed in jeopardy because now Ukraine serves as a nidus or a focus for all of those surrounding areas, including countries in the European Union, for which the European Union has been trying to make a rabies-free block in terms of at least carnivores. Of course, there's rabies in bats, too, throughout you know, all continents, with the exception of Antarctica.
but from the focus of the EU and that plan, they were to try to remove, minimize, eliminate selective variants that are maintained in dogs and in wildlife in Western Europe and, in essence, in theory, in the rest of Europe to come, starting with EU-based countries. All of that's at risk now. So animals don't tend to recognize borders. <laughs> I've never met, met too many animals who recognize borders unless their owners didn't have them on a leash. Uh, how it ignored do you think rabies is as a disease in general, in your experience? Rabies is what we call an NTD or a neglected tropical disease or a neglected viral disease or a neglected viral zoonosis. One of the reasons why we say it's neglected is because dogs are the largest global reservoir. All developed countries have eliminated canine rabies. And so people think, okay, if it's not in my backyard, it's not in your backyard either. This is one of the reasons for neglect. There's another reason why rabies is neglected, because it's not a human contagion, such as we've just seen from the pandemic, typically. And it's not an economically important disease to the same way that we see things like avian influenza, and you see the impact that that has on domestic poultry and the millions of animals that are euthanized or destroyed because of the impact that avian influenza has upon a flock nationally and globally, or swine diseases. So if you think of the traditional livestock, poultry, fisheries, these are agriculturally economically important. And hence the border situations and trade are severely affected. Smallpox was the first disease that was eradicated. The only second disease that most people have never heard of is rinderpest. One of the reasons why it was so important to eradicate rinderpest was because it was devastating in the developing world in particular. Millions starved because of the impact this disease had upon livestock. So it was not a public health issue per se beyond the impact that it had upon pastoral populations, starvation, etc., and hence the impact on global trade. If you consider those economic aspects, then you can understand that with rare exceptions, rabies does not have the same economic dimensions that other agricultural diseases of importance does. In the New World, we probably have the largest focus of agricultural impact because of vampire bat rabies and the mandatory hematophic feeding and hence excretion of virus and vampire bats from Mexico down to Argentina. Aside from that, we have some cases of rabies in livestock, but for the most part we don't eat dogs. And so you have the dilemma of People in health ministries often think they should be focused upon humans. People in agricultural communities think they should be looking at agricultural commodities. Dogs are neither. Public health folks, physicians, don't see why should they should be vaccinating dogs. And if it's not an agricultural commodity to the agriculture ministry, whose responsibility is it? This is also one of these issues from a transdisciplinary standpoint that rabies falls beyond these cracks. So it's neglected because it's not in a developed country. It's neglected because it's not economically important. And there's also what we call the neglect of surveillance. So if you don't have many cases, you don't get many, much money from the ministry. If you don't have much money from the ministry, how do you do effective laboratory-based surveillance? And how do you do it locally, far from the capital, where most of the reference laboratories are, and with very few cases, you have no ministerial support to do laboratory-based surveillance. So it's this issue of neglect of a very feared disease that's not supported in large because it's not economically important to the West because of dogs and because of the fear and loathing and because of the lack of responsibility and because it tends to affect the poor. And so for this reason, a variety of reasons why rabies is neglected, then it becomes superimpositional neglected whenever you've had areas or places that have had rabies in 
control, moving towards elimination of, say, canine rabies, for which there's a global basis today. And any time you have conflict, uh, conflict socioeconomically, environmentally, think about Haiti. Haiti is one of our poorest countries in the Americas, and we still have canine rabies in Haiti. Think about the Middle East, obviously another issue where we are going to be having and have problems regionally. Uh, Israel uses oral vaccination of wildlife. Well, obviously there's a lot of border issues going on. Parts of Africa, think about the Sudan. Any place you have socio-politically, economically, environmentally problems, you're going to have breakdowns in public health systems, which are always going to involve rabies. Ukraine is another perfect example of one that was in the movement towards control, towards elimination, that's all been upended. Yeah. Um, this just occurred to me, it's actually not on the list here, but so given um, all the pressure there is and uh, limitations on resources to deal with Ukraine in general, um, and, and what's going on as far as support, whether it's governmental or whether it's individual or uh, NGO. Um, one of our concerns is for people to understand that this is a real issue. Yes, it's, it's not in lieu of taking care of people or feeding people or moving people to safety, but it's in concert with. Is that, does that make sense? I think when you're talking about limited resources. Sure, I, I think aid to your crane writ large and then also drilled down to the standpoint of rabies makes perfect sense because rabies is a disease of nature. Rabies is a perfect one health example where it's not just an issue focused on human public health. It's not just a concern of veterinary medicine. It's not just an issue of wildlife biologists and management. It's a true One Health consideration with those sciences, as well as with the health economics of the kind of impacts that this is having locally and regionally, given the success of the past. It's also clearly a role for individuals who care from a humanitarian standpoint, the state of health of humans, domestic animals or wildlife, none of these are beneficial given the current circumstances. And so it takes a huge cadre of individuals in terms of time, talent, and treasure to be able to show however minimally and however slow and however small that there are ways to make inroads because we, we understand how rabies is caused. We have great depth of understanding of the epidemiology of this disease. Laboratory-based surveillance we've been able to do for over a century. Even longer, vaccine-preventable diseases. Rabies is a vaccine-preventable disease in humans and domestic animals and in wildlife at the source. This is one of the few things you can say about any disease. And so any inroads you can make into any country for this perfect One Health exemplary and in particular, in a situation of strife and for a bridgehead, I think is moving certainly in the right direction. Is rabies vaccine available worldwide? The question in terms of the availability of biologics for rabies, whether human or veterinary medicine, one of the things that has to be understood is that we're talking about a biologic as opposed to a drug. So as opposed to a drug like aspirin that could be made into the millions, these are biologics with a long essence event horizon because they have to be produced in cells or for immune globulins in animals or in humans, which means that a producer has to know what's the market. There has to be a market for the producer to know what the market is. So when you talk to a producer, they say we have no limitation on supply as long as we know what the market is. Either the market being definable by those who are vaccinating animals or people or definable 
in terms of what we consider the overall problem. So if there's not a definable market, then there's not going to be an unlimited supply. One of the reasons why people die from rabies today in the 21st century is because they receive no prophylaxis. Why do they receive no prophylaxis? Well, they may not understand what the disease is. This is what our knowledge, attitude, and practices surveys suggest is that sometimes we still need great inroads with education. Another perfect One Health issue, educate the children, they'll educate their parents about what we mean by ideal veterinary care of a pet and starting to change that particular bond. If people don't understand what the disease is, how are they going to understand to vaccinate their dog? How are they going to understand to avoid exposures? How are they going to understand that this is a vaccine preventable disease and that the first thing they can do is wash their hands or the wound with soap and water. That will reduce the burden of the relative risk of acquisition a lot, but that's an educational component, let alone to go and seek medical care. Um, There's so many very simple things today um, because of this little handheld computer. There are simple apps. If you think about a restaurant review, let's say with Yelp, You can find out whether or not I'm going to be happy going to that restaurant. Why is it so then unbelievable to think of if you're in whatever situation and you've been bitten by an animal, why waste what little resources you have that entire day to go all around the city or cities by walking, by bus, by taxi to find out, does that pharmacy have rabies biologics? Does that particular clinic have immune globulin? There are simple apps that are available that you could, and then also say, this place said they had it and they don't. Almost by group feed communication along similar lines, you can have simple apps for the developing world for this commodity because the market's ill-defined to be able to say who has rabies biologics, as well as having, well, this is what should go on so there are no medical misadventures and so that you're the informed consumer on a very critical biologic to ensure that you're getting what you need in the prescribed recommendations from WHO or your local health authority. So it depends who you talk to. The individual who's gotten bitten and his family members died of rabies because there was nothing at the market may say there's a limitation in supply and recognizing that these are biologics that are not inexpensive. We're not talking about pennies and, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, producers are not not not-for-profit. There is no not-for-profit rabies biologics manufacturer in the world. So if you can't give it away for free, there's got to be some obvious compensation to a producer to do this and to ship it and then to administer it. Um, Although all rabies vaccinations, both for humans and animals, should be free. Ideally, we know that they're not. And so there should be ways to try to ameliorate the ability to produce as needed versus what is needed to put those together. Again, another perfect example for rabies, for life-saving biologic that nobody really needs to die from rabies in the 21st century. Hmm. Along those lines, is humans generally in a high-risk rabies area? The concept of whether or not we should apply pre-exposure to individuals who aren't occupationally exposed is a little bit controversial. And some of the health economic studies have demonstrated that if the relative risks or burden to certain populations are high enough, it may make sense. Now, you know, obviously to the exposed individual, they would ask the question, why isn't everybody vaccinated? Well, because it's not a human contagion. It's not a childhood um, concern. There are certain situations in the world where it does make sense to vaccinate certain of those populations where, for example, dog rabies control is still years away for a variety of reasons that they're not able to manage animal populations and the exposure rates are so high vaccination of children has been entertained in very selective situations. And there are certain parts of the world, we mentioned a little bit about vampire bats in Latin America, indigenous communities. There is no surveillance. Dog vaccination is irrelevant. 
you know, unless we're thinking about vaccination of vampire bats, which are not readily available, and some people are. So you don't have surveillance, you've got remote populations, you have no way to easily predict. And by the time that an outbreak has been found in a village and those children are dead, it's too late to come in. That front has moved someplace else. So probably on the basis of what we know today, there are some real world populations where pre-exposure vaccination in a childhood sense, in the same way that some of these indigenous communities in Amazonia, for example, are reached with childhood vaccines, um, should be entertained for pre-exposure vaccination of rabies. And similarly, there may be other environmental situations elsewhere in the world where traditional dog rabies control is still not within our grasp in a timely manner. Outstanding. Those are actually my questions. Is there, based on our conversation, are there things that you think we haven't covered or that you'd want to add? Or, or I, I think you touched. I think you touched on the basis. I think you pulled out some of the things that to get me to drill down to some of the other answers. Um, I can't really, you know. You know, we went over the issue of, you know, why Ukraine? Why not Africa? Why not Asia? Uh, why not the Middle East? It's because we were well on our way marching west to east for a huge bridgehead. And Ukraine will undo decades worth of work of what had been going on previously. And so you, it, it'd be great to do everything all at once, but you triage situations the same as you triage in an ER. Have you had the experience in specifically another war-torn part of the world um, where you've had the opportunity to look at the rabies situation or be involved in? Probably the one that most comes to mind is Haiti, but there are environmental situations in Haiti that set things in play, first from the earthquake and then in terms of hurricanes. So you've got environmental <coughs> issues. Um, you have political issues in terms of stability. Yeah. And hence, when you have the breakdown of societal norms from that super effaced poverty issue, then you have also issues of safety and violence. And so when you have that combination of perfect storms. Rabies is one of those, but there are also, with the breakdown of those systems, many other public health issues as well. And if you don't have the ability to do everything equally well, um, and in particular, agencies uh, are not going to put their people in harm's way, these are some of the reasons why the zero by 30, the concept that we can eliminate all human rabies cases caused by dogs, simply aren't going to be attainable because we don't have control of these situations. You, you, you try to get your biggest bang for the buck in the shortest period of time. Mm -hmm. And anytime you have war, political instability, poverty, environmental perturbations, issues of violence, crime, etc. They only set back the clock for whatever you could call as a, a public health advantage. S similar situations um, border to border in Africa. Yeah. Um, and and in l luckily now less in parts of Asia. Uh, but Asia and Africa are some of the places that the burdens of human rabies because of unmitigated perpetuation of rabies and dogs goes on. In theory, in hope, um, because there are different relative risks epidemiologically based upon the rabies viruses. What we don't want to see is the comeback of canine rabies into Ukraine as opposed to the promulgation of canine rabies that we already know is in Haiti and Bolivia and Sub-Saharan mm -hmm. Africa and parts of Asia like India and China, and that's bona fide dog rabies, which is a virus that is evolutionary, developed 
to promulgate primarily in dogs. Um, many different rabies viruses have different potentialities. We hope that's not going to be the situation in Ukraine that would further exacerbate the situation both locally and globally with the impact to its neighbors. You hope that there are certain rabies viruses that are more amenable to prevention control and elimination than what we see in some of the other areas, which is why it takes so much time, talent, and treasure to put these out for where there were no programs as opposed to the amelioration and setting back to where there were programs previously. So it's, I think that's it. Outstanding. Thank Thanks. you so much. No, no, it's, it's my been, pleasure. Been How, excellent. How are we doing? You think, what would you say? Oh, you we're supposed to run the tape? He's great on it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Thanks. So, we ready to do it for real now? <laughs> <laughs> How about the vice there? Are we do okay? Yeah. She, she's yeah. suffering yeah. over there. Oh, thank you. And I think you've got enough that you can intersperse.